We're <clears throat> looking this morning at the topic, Jesus' power over nature. Jesus' power over nature. So turn to Matthew, the 8th chapter. We're going to read verses 23 to 27. Jesus was consistently demonstrating who he was by the miracles that he did. Which would always confirm the word. Matthew 8, verses 23. Thank you, Jesus. Read a passage of scripture. <clears throat> and when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, <clears throat> and so much that the ship was covered with waves, but he was asleep. Everybody there? We'll wait. Matthew 8, verse 23. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> okay, 1, verse 24. Behold, there came, <clears throat> there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch as the ship was covered with waves, but he was asleep. And the disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye so fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? So what we find here is a principle. Jesus had said, we were going to go across to the other side. Before they got there, there was a great storm that arose, tempest, and literally was shaking the ship from one end to the other and covering it with waves. And so they go to him in an act of desperation, and they tell him, <clears throat> basically, they panicked. And they tell him, literally, Lord, we're going to die. And uh, and he rise, arose and he brought everything to a state of calmness. Now, this illustrates a principle. He rebuked them, not because they woke him up. He rebuked them because they believed that there was no hope for them and that they were all going to perish. Yes. Just real brief, what, what really impresses me is that God gave his word that they were going to get across. Yes. And you can rely on God's word to the point where there's a peace that passes with all understanding to where you can sleep, even yes. in the midst of the storm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the idea is <clears throat> Jesus was in the boat. They had seen him do miracles before, <clears throat> but yet and still that's all forgotten because mm. of this great situation that's taking place. Everything goes out of the window. It illustrates a principle. The principle is... God expects us not to look at our circumstances, but He expects us to have faith in Him mm -hmm. when we're going through the circumstances. Mm -hmm. That's right. He expects us <clears throat> to expect an end to the trial, that it will be resolved, and He will be glorified because He's in the boat with us. Now, <clears throat> we want to take a look at some things that come from this situation. Scripture teaches... In all circumstances, the saint is not to perceive from a fallible human perspective, but from God's perspective of wisdom and confidence. When I'm going through a situation, or if I'm not going through a situation, I ask the Lord to give me His perspective. I want to see, whether I'm on a mountaintop or if I'm in a valley, I want to see my life from His perspective, not my perspective. Because if you see your situation, whether good or bad, from a human perspective, first and foremost, you're going to see it from a temporary perspective, from a temporal perspective, which never 
remains. It's always going to change. You're always going to go from one crisis to another. That's the way most people live their lives. Going from one crisis to another or going in circles, mm. never progressing. Because they're looking at life from a human perspective. We want to see life from God's perspective. We want to see our trials from God's perspective. Why? Because when you see your situation, your life, from God's perspective, and God gives us a twofold perspective. He gives us what's called discernment, and He gives us understanding so that we can see things as He sees them. It's most important. <clears throat> mm. Scripture teaches in all circumstances the saint is not to perceive from a fallible human perspective, but from <clears throat> God's perspective a wisdom and confidence. Turn to Philippians, the second chapter, verse 5 to 6. When you see your life from God's perspective, you will also be able to deal with the circumstances. Sometimes in a miraculous way. Because with the perception comes the ability to deal with the circumstance. Good morning. Philippians, the second chapter. Verses 5 to 6. Scripture is giving us the same principle in many different passages that we are to release our human view and take upon ourselves God's view, God's perspective of all things. Philippians, the second chapter, verses 5 to 6. Thank you, Jesus. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. The Lord never lost God's perspective of all things. He dealt with everything, not from a human perspective, <coughs> but from God's perspective. And he understood how to deal with all circumstances because of it. Yes. You're going to have the obvious way of thinking, which is, that's all very well because Jesus is God. So if you're asking people who are not God to behave the way that Jesus is behaving, who is God, there's going to be a slight problem with that thinking. <laughs> well, the idea is, as we read the scriptures, telling us he gave up being God to come down to become human. I don't believe that. But he never <laughs> lost God's perspective. <laughs> That's yeah. That's why he did it, so we could take on God's perspective. Yeah. Yes. We could see our lives as God sees life. Can I ask you a personal question? Sure. In all the years that you've <laughs> been uh, promoting this excellent way of living, would you say it's been difficult for you to think as God thinks? Or has it been easy? Once you get into the concepts no, you, you begin to see it that way automatically. It's just a question of making the transition from the yeah. human to the divine in our own mind. That's where the renewing of the mind comes in. We, right. God will change our thoughts from a human-centered perspective to a God-centered perspective. And along that, with that comes also all the victories and everything else that God will lead us into. And now we want to continue. Turn to 1 Corinthians, 2nd chapter, verses 15 to 16. And this gives you the understanding of comparing things from God's perspective and from man's human centered perspective. Praise the Lord. Amen. First Corinthians. So, so, quick, let me, can I ask a quick, quick question? Sure. So that would be being in the mindset of God, that, that transition 
from the fleshly mindset to the godly mindset, Christ-like mindset, would be instead of getting angered and biting into it, you just bless you, God bless you, and we'll go on about your business. Because once you bite into it, you start a chain, you're grabbing your own tail. Exactly. And you're running in circles. Exactly. And that's the way that the enemy operates. Yes. Get you it, focused. Yes. Yeah. And so totally. if you if you don't bite your tail, you're moving forward. Exactly. Well, okay. You're pretty wise. God just gave that to you. That's not me, buddy. <laughs> I'm going through it. That's why. Right. <laughs> you and me both, trust me. First Corinthians, second chapter, verse 15 to 16. Thank you, Lord. Praise First Corinthians, second chapter, verse 15 to 16. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged by no man. So when you can see things from God's perspective, when you begin to get discernment and understanding, then the people around you who are focusing from a human perspective don't stand a chance to bring you down, intimidate mm -hmm. you, or do anything else to, dra to, to yeah. turn you away. That's why the Lord Jesus was never detracted by the things that were going on around him. Although they were consistently trying to divert him, trying to intimidate him through peer pressure, through whatever. Mm. And Jesus remained unmoved. Plus you shine. Oh, and you yeah. set a godly example for yes. them to follow. Exactly. So like you say, Richard, it's a win-win situation. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Verse Thank 16. You, for who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So nobody can instruct us. Our instructor is God, the Holy Spirit, not man. And in that respect, you're wide open to stay free. And to... Remain free. Hmm. This world is always going to try to get you to conform to its pattern of thinking, its way of thinking. <clears throat> but in Christ, you're free from the world's influence. You're hmm. free from the world's dictates. Hmm. This is a question of remaining free because Christians all the time are going back under that influence and going into bondage to it. Let's go on. Scripture teaches, when the saint truly sees as God sees, he can do the miraculous works of Christ. Turn to Philippians 4th chapter, verse 11 to 13. When you see things as God sees them, then you have the ability to deal with things as God deals with them. Now, when you read Paul's epistles, you will find he repeatedly talks about, uses the word know. Four, I believe. Oh, thanks. Translated no, K-N-O-W, I know, we know. He's consistently referring to this. Why is he referring it in this way? The word know is translated in two different ways, two different words. One means perception, it's translated as no. The other means understanding. It's translated as no. So Paul is consistently, as he writes these epistles, is receiving knowledge from the Holy Spirit and is imparting it in his epistles to the church so they can receive what he's receiving. And then he goes on. Philippians, the fourth chapter, verses 11 to 13. Not that I speak in respect of want or need, for I have learned... In whatever state I am, therewith to be content. When you begin to see things from God's perspective, God will give you an assurance, a contentment. This world is always trying to keep you dissatisfied. This world is always trying to keep you in a state in which you don't focus on what you have, you focus on what you don't have. So that you can pursue the things that you think you need. 
It's a trick. It's a con job from the enemy. When you see things from God's perspective, you can be satisfied with a little <coughs> because God will be your source and make that little that you have a lot. Mm, amen. It's a question of seeing your life and your circumstances as God sees them. And with that will come contentment in all situations. You can sit in a shack with a can of beans and feel peace, love, and joy. You don't need to be in a banquet hall somewhere. You don't need to be riding around in a Cadillac to, to receive God's enjoyment of life. It's not what's going on around you. It's what's going on within you Amen. that brings forth the satisfaction with the life that God has called you <coughs> to live and to experience. So Paul talks about that. I've learned in all circumstances to be content. And then he goes on. <clears throat> I know, I discern, I comprehend both how to be abased and I know, I comprehend, I perceive how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. Now there is a fallacious teaching going around the church <clears throat> that you always have to ride on the high side of things. Otherwise, you don't have faith. There's a fallacious and erroneous teaching going on that you should never be in a situation where you lack anything because your faith will enable you to always receive the abundance. This is not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying if you walk the walk that Christ walked, if you live the life that Christ lived, there are going to be times when you're going to suffer a lack in your life. But God will give you the ability to sail on undaunted in the things that you lack. Because God will meet your need. Mm. God will be your sufficiency. Amen. When you see your life from God's perspective, you get discernment and understanding and ability to deal with all things. Just like Paul says, I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. Now, does this include the miraculous? Yes, it does. Turn to Acts 14th chapter. Acts the 14th chapter. to Acts, the 14th chapter, we want verses 8 to 10. <clears throat> Acts 14, verses 8 to 10. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. So this is a man who was paralyzed from birth. And he was well known in this particular town. Everybody knew who he was and what his condition was. The same heard Paul speaking, who steadfastly beholding him, and perceiving, and perceiving, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed. The perception comes from God. As a, as a lame man, a paralyzed man, sitting in this particular situation, uh, spot, Paul is preaching. God gives Paul his view of this man through perception, discernment. Paul sees this man as God sees him. That he's got the ability to have his situation changed. Yes. Now, where it says, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed. Now, people can be healed that are unsaved, can't they? 
insurance. So it's not a matter of their faith all the time. It's a matter of, I believe, your faith in healing them, being that, that extension of God, basically. Well, what he's saying here is not that man has had a faith to be saved, he has faith to be healed. He believes that Paul is Yeah, I'm not, I don't mean saved, but healed. Even if an unsaved person mm -hmm. can be healed, say they're crippled, you can heal them through your faith. Sure. Okay. Jesus did it all the time. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm kind of referring to. Uh, but the idea here is the principle is perception. God mm -hmm. will give you the ability to see things as he sees sure. them. And with this ability will come the ability to deal with the problem. Discernment. The two in. go hand in hand. Perception and ability. Now we see Paul looks at this man and he perceives that this man has faith to be healed. So what does he do? What does he do? Verse 10. Said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. So... The perception, seeing things as God sees them, will give the ability to deal with the situation from God's mm. ability. Amen. Paul didn't have this man <clears throat> healed through anything he did. It was God <laughs> all the way. Amen. God gave him the perception. God gave him the, the miraculous capacity to have the man healed. All the man did was ac acquiesce to the faith that was already in him through the spoken word. The principle is... <clears throat> To cultivate God's view at all times. Now the enemy will come into your life and try to do just the opposite. He'll try to bring you down, put doubt in your life, in your mind, and have you focus on your circumstance. Yeah. You focus on your circumstance, you become limited to the circumstance. You can't go beyond it. It's like putting yourself into a box. And you're confined by the walls of that box. It doesn't change. So what God is telling us is in Christ, there is no limitation. There is no box that can confine us. When you see things as God sees them, you're wide open to have the circumstance changed by the ability that God gives you, puts into your life. The scripture says no temptation. <clears throat> that can overcome you. With that temptation is a way in which you're going to escape it. But you have to see it from God's perspective. Paul illustrates this point. I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. In order to do that, we have to put down our own perception. Our own inability. Oh, it can't be done. That's the first thing that you hear people say. I can't. Negative. Limitation. As soon as they entertain that kind of a thought, you can forget about it. There's, there's, there's no hope for them out of that circumstance yeah. because they've closed the door on them themselves. When we speak the word of God and we see as God sees, then the door will swing wide open. Let's continue. <clears throat> Acts, the eighth chapter. Verse 18 to 24, we see the same principle. Perception, enabling the individual to deal with the circumstances from God's perspective. God gives them the ability to go forth and overcome the problem. Acts 8, verses 18 to 24. Here we have a man called Simon, who is a sorcerer. Now this is a guy practicing magic, doing all sorts of miracles until he comes in contact with the disciples and he sees the disciples have far more power than he could dream of and it changes his whole life. <clears throat> Verse 18, and when Simon saw through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> but Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. <clears throat> thou hast neither part 
the lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. So he says he's looking into Simon's soul, and he's giving him <clears throat> what Simon needs to do. He's in bondage. He's under condemnation, under judgment, on his way to hell, unless he repents. Then he goes on. For I perceive, that's the Holy Spirit giving Peter God's view of Simon's life, Simon's circumstance. I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray for Ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. So, God will give you insight into other people's lives. And you, like Peter, can say the words that will set them free. Good morning, Good morning. guys. I'll wait. Come on. Have a no, man, she, come on. Come on. she can't. Here, I, I can't get back there. Come on. There's a chair right there. Go back. Go back. Come on. Come on. Yeah, uh, we have a metal okay. chair here. Yeah, we have one. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Hi, sweetheart. I am. I'll be better. Thank you. Good catch, bro. Sit right there. He's in the chair. I can't. She can't sit in those chairs. The, the chair stuck in my. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Mm -hmm. you got it? Yeah. So we see that with uh, God's perspective, not only can you stay free, you can free up other people. Amen. That's our ministry, setting the captives free in Christ. But we can't set anybody else free until we ourselves are free. Now, we want to take a look at this whole aspect of perceiving God from God's perspective, perceiving life from God's perspective. That's the last thing we read. Okay, thank you. Turn to 1 Corinthians, 2nd chapter, verses 1 to 5. 1 Corinthians, 2nd chapter, verses 1 to 5. Paul talks about this. Paul talks about human wisdom, the wisdom of God. What is wisdom? Wisdom is knowledge rightly put into operation. God gives us discernment, perception, and understanding. This constitutes knowledge. When we take the knowledge of God and we apply the knowledge of God, it becomes wisdom. Now, 1 Corinthians, 2nd chapter, verse 1 to 5. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. In other words, Paul is saying he came to the Corinthian church not speaking from a human perspective. He did not appeal to people's understanding from a human perspective. He said, I shut myself down trying not to uh, approach you from a logical perspective. What did he do? For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So he said, Paul was a scholar. Paul had sat under the foot of uh, one of the most famous scholars Israel ever produced. But Paul said, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, shut down the scholarly part, take yourself out of the equation, allow me to work through you with my wisdom and my perspective. When you speak the word, you just focus on Christ and the crucifixion of Christ. Don't focus on anything else, and I'll do the rest. This is what he told in the Corinthian church. Verse 3. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. 
in my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So what Paul is saying, when he went to the Corinthian church, the church repented and was saved because they received God's perspective, not man's perspective of their life and their circumstances. And in that particular capacity, Paul imparted to them eternal understanding. The difference between the wisdom of men and the wisdom of God is that the wisdom of man is finite, limited, and <clears throat> going to change. The wisdom of God, that is the knowledge of God, rightly applied, is eternal. It never changes. It's always with you. When you walk in God's perception, God's understanding, and God's power, everything has to depart. Everything has to yield to the word that you're going to speak. This is exactly what Paul did in the Corinthian church situation. He walked in the power of God, he spoke the word in the power of God, and the Holy Spirit took that church and made it, brought it out of <clears throat> temporality into a state of eternality. We have the same power to do the same thing. Get ourselves out of the way. Don't approach things from your perspective. Approach things from God's perspective. He'll give you insight, understanding, and ability to deal with the things of your own life and to deal with the things of others. Now, in closing, understand that the knowledge of God is progressive. It exists on <coughs> levels. Paul was on such a high level that even the other apostles couldn't comprehend some of the things Paul was saying. Paul received the view of God to such a degree that the other apostles for a time wouldn't even accept him as an apostle. Turn to the book of Galatians. <coughs> First chapter. I'm going to start in verse 11 and read down to verse 17. When you get God's perspective, there's no limit to it. You're going to get greater and greater and greater comprehension, grow to higher and higher levels <coughs> to a point where even the people around you won't be able to comprehend what you can comprehend. Galatians, first chapter, starting in verse 11. Paul speaks here. He says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. So in other words, Paul, as you know, persecuted the church, and then he repented. And what he's saying here is a gospel that Paul preached was not given to him by the other apostles or any other Christian. It was given to him by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He goes on to talk about that. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. For you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many of my, my equals in mine own nation, being more <coughs> exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, he's talking about God intervened in his life and totally changed it, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Paul is saying everything that happened to him was supernatural at the hands of Jesus Christ himself. He didn't even talk to men for three and a half years. He says, Neither when I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, 
But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. Paul was in the Arabian desert being taught this gospel, which didn't come from men. It came from the Lord Jesus Christ. And it had things in it that men had never received before. God gave Paul a perception of himself that had never been given to other men, even the apostles that had walked with him for three and a half years. Closing, turn to Galatians, I mean, turn to 2 Peter, 3rd chapter, verse 15 to 16. When God gives you a perspective, He gives you a perspective. And that perspective is unique. It doesn't come from man, it comes from God. You take what God gives you, you take the view, you take the revelation that God gives you, and you cultivate that. You hold on to it. Because it's priceless. And don't let men talk you out of it or circumstances cause you to deny it. 2 Peter, 3rd chapter, verse 15 to 16. Peter talks about Paul in Paul's epistles. <clears throat> now here he just gets to talking about the end of the creation and how we should be ready and prepared for the ultimate entrance into eternity, the eternal state. In verse 15, he says, An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom, the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you. The wisdom given unto him hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles speaking in them of those things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So at the end of this all, they understood that the gospel of Paul was unique, different, but not separate from the gospel that they understood. It was far more expansive. Paul speaks about the things of eternity far more than the other apostles. Paul had a comprehension of the destiny of man that the other apostles didn't have. Why? Because the gospel that he received in his walk with the Lord after his conversion was to take Paul into a higher state of revelation, a higher state of per perception of God and the things of God. Amen. Enter into the perception that God will give you of all things. And I guarantee you, your life will change. And things that you thought were so important in your life become diminutive in comparison to the things that God will reveal to you of what's waiting for you in this life and what's waiting for you in eternity. Again, it's a win-win situation. It's up to us to take advantage of.